But just to begin, uh, just asking where the, the idea for Infabric sort of spawned from? Like, uh, I guess lots of places really. I mean, I love shopping. Um, it, it came from that more, more than other films. That I think the high street is dying, and I remember it as a kid, with department stores and so on, and they had this, they always had an eccentric feel to them really. Um, so this film is just kind of accentuating that to some degree. But also I think clothing and, um, you know, I buy secondhand, this is, this is a secondhand piece of clothing. Um, and just, you imagine, you know, what sweat patch was there before mine and um, what kind of person was that and who's going to wear it after me and so on and so on. So I, I, I don't know, just this whole chain of, of clothing. Um, and yeah, I mean, just, just people's reactions to clothing, how... Um, so I think the idea of f squeezing in a, a, a curse into this was all about people feeling empowered when they wear something, people feeling inadequate when they wear something. Uh, so we, you know, the Babs character and her body dysmorphia, people getting turned on by clothing, um, being disgusted by clothing, like Marianne when she has to deal with Gwen's underwear and she refuses to wash it. So I think, yeah, and I think the most, for me, the most, the strongest element of, of a haunting was this dream Sheila has where she has to clear out, clear out the, 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 the wardrobe of, um, some, of her mother who died. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting how any, any human being can have a very strong reaction to a piece of clothing if it has a connection to a human being, uh, to a, another, sorry, another human being. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Marianne. I think she's just terrific in it. She must be so thrilled to collaborate with her on this project. Cause she's, I am, yeah, 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 yeah. She's just a brilliant, brilliant actress. Yes. Um, no, there's nothing else to say. I mean, she's she's brilliant. Um, I had to muffle my laughter sometimes when she's on. It just, I think, I think what she brought to it, which I wasn't really aware, of, I wasn't sort of. This wasn't so much in the script in terms of the 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 tone of it, but that. A lot of the scenes when she's angry really had a comic side after she she did that, which I, really glad that happened. But it wasn't something I really pushed for. But I think she's so good at kind of lowering her voice and. That seething anger, <laughs> that seething anger coming through. Um, so yeah, uh, we're very blessed to have her. Absolutely. And I, I absolutely love the film, but I, I think it was when I saw it, it was the sort of full film of the day, and I, it struck me. As, in fact, it feels like the sort of film that should be watched on its own, on, a, on, a, on one evening on its own. I was just wondering about your opinions on festival culture for, mm -hmm. and what you make of this kind of over almost the way we the way we we almost binge watch films. But I've watched, I've seen twenty eight since I've been here, which is. An, an obscene amount of movies to watch in the space of sort of six days. I've seen do you think zero. it's? Do you think that's quite an unhealthy way to, to take uh, movies in? And do, does it frustrate you as a filmmaker that you know people are seeing it and it could be their fourth or fifth mm. film of the day, and perhaps their twenty sixth of uh, in the course of a week, for example? Well, tough on me if they don't like it. You know, I should do better next time. I can't blame it on a festival. Or blame it on the person who's tired. I should do a better film. Um, that's just the way it is. I mean, everyone's different. I, I couldn't do that. I could when I was younger. I could I could watch you know three films in a row. There's just no way I could do that now. I mean, even one film, I'd probably watch it in four, four different attempts. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, everyone's different, really. Um, it's different for me as a filmmaker at a festival where I, I'm here talking to you and I can't watch, you know, climax or high, high life but um it's fine you know i'm very lucky to make a film so i'm not not complaining an interview with me is better than climax and high life anyway so i said an interview with <laughs> me is better than climax and high life it's not they're both brilliant um and i was wondering too because obviously just when we were speaking before this interview you mentioned about the joy in watching movies in in the cinema watching mm -hmm. films in big crowds uh and i was just wondering about because obviously uh, roma won the golden lion um at venice mm -hmm. and that's a netflix film and just your your thoughts on the, the kind of the future of, of cinema and, and how things are moving to streaming services and how you'd feel if you got told by uh, one of your producers or, or the money men above you that, that your film is going to be exclusive to, to Netflix in a certain region in the world for example well if I can make a film that's a good thing um, I think the wider question is how to afford to make films um, it's I mean that's I'm not an, I'm not really qualified to answer that but it seems the DVD market is dying whether that's whether that money's being moved to streaming I, that I don't know but um, my default is the cinema because I, I grew up that way so I guess I'm just old fashioned whether that's again I think all these things are very personal and, and I, I think it's, about, it's having a choice that's what it is 
stream if you want to stream, go to a cinema if you want to have a cinema. It's it's when something becomes a monopoly, that's when it becomes an issue. That if I want to go to Maplin's and buy cable, oh, no, I can't go to Maplin's. I have to order it online and wait for the postman. Um, that's not the future I thought we were having. I thought the future was about being pluralistic and having choices and not having one dominant factor coming in. So that's all, all I would say, really, to have a choice of how you see a film. I, I, was, I was reading if you, on, on the kind of festival website a bit before I came out here, all the different kind of uh, briefs or blurbs on, on each movie, the little descriptions they have on mm -hmm. each page. And yours, what struck me was, on, your, they, they mentioned sort of three or four different filmmakers when they were speaking about yours. In a sense, it's almost like they, when people see your work, they're always looking for, for places you, you've drawn uh -huh. inspiration. I was just wondering uh, where, you, my fault, yeah. <laughs> where you do draw inspiration from sort of more so than anywhere else, but who would you say is the, the filmmaker that inspired you the most? For this film, you mean? Uh, um, I, just, I guess maybe mm -hmm. just sort of in your career, really. Um, I don't really have one, really. I mean, they're, they're definitely I'm influenced by filmmakers, but there's no one single filmmaker. Um, it, it changes. Um, I guess at the moment, my biggest influence, my biggest influence is Helen Catet and Bruno Fazzani. I was blown away by Amer um, and The Strange Colour of Your Body's Tears. Uh, and Lucille had Lilovich as well. Um, with this film, there, there, there wasn't. I wasn't really thinking about films so much. It was more shopping. I just adored those department stores, and I adored the catalogues and Keenholz sculptures with these scary mannequins. Um, I would take little elements from films, but not the kind of films you would expect, you know, like uh, Lethal Weapon, where Mel Gibson's got this, the bad guy in his leg lock. I showed that to Richard, who played Mr. Lundy, um, when he gets the shoplifter in his leg lock. So little things like that, I just say, you know, have a look at this. And um, But no, I mean, I, I, I have a big fondness for a lot of Euro exploitation, that, that, that's for sure. Um, but it wasn't an overriding influence on this film. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are definitely shots in the film which echo other films, but not. there's no big... It didn't feel like I was owing any kind of big debt this time. And the interesting thing is I, I, I thought I was writing something original and I realised it's about as derivative as you can get with the idea of a haunted piece of clothing and going from person to person. But when I wrote it, I thought, oh, for once I've done something original because everything before that was purposefully steeped in genre tropes. I thought this was original. <laughs> you didn't have to see this way. Because I was wondering, when I was a, a kid, I used to hate going to the shops and the big department stores. What was it that you loved so much then about, about those experiences? It's just like another world. I always liked entering a world. That's what I love about film. I, I don't really... I'm not much of a plot person. You probably, you probably guessed that. But um, for me, atmosphere and character, that's what always draws me into something. Um, with it, and, and music, again, it's about not hearing a good tune, it's about hearing a great atmosphere and entering this other world. And So a shop can do that as much as a film can do that. Um, so this is not this is not criticising the shops at all. Um, this is actually like a love letter to, to the shops. Um, there, was a, there was a kind of a satirical element to consumerist culture, but not with the main characters. Um, Sheila deserves that dress. and Her death is not judgmental. It, it, it's, a, it's a random force. Um, but the shops, um, what I love about department stores is they're out of time. I set this in the 90s, it, even though it feels like it's set in the 70s. It was important that it's set later on, that you feel like, oh, yeah, but these, these places don't change that much. And, um, but the mannequins I found very scary when I was a kid. Um, but again, this element where people were, the movement of people shopping the reactions people had when they come out of the changing room. You, there were these very private, intimate reactions going on in people's heads in the changing rooms. And you don't always see those reactions, but you know a lot is going on in people's heads. Which is kind of a silly thing to say, because that's, that's happening all the time. But, but yeah, but just that relationship between how people see themselves, how they transform, and how the, or how they just look at themselves and feel even worse. Um, and uh, my, my final question uh, is just about what's what's coming up for you next. Have you, have you started working yet on your on your fifth movie? Or uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm trying to make this film for six years now, and it just we just hit a stumbling block each time. Um, 
so it's it's written. I, I just, I mean, I wrote it. I think in two thousand, just after Barbarian in two thousand and twelve. So, the Duke overtook it. In Fabric overtook it. So I might even write another film and overtake that yeah. one I, I wrote six years ago. Um, I just don't know. It's 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 always the unknown when you make a film and you just have to be thankful that you made the film you've, you've just done and be happy with that and and just keep going really so if you don't mind me asking what is it that's holding that project back oh it's expensive it's set um in 1980 in new york in a lot of gay nightclubs like male it's, it's pretty much all all male um so i guess it's another niche film that, I've, that i'm making um so it's just very hard to make a niche film which has a high budget. But, you know, so what? It's life. Just, you know, I'm not going to complain about it. Just get on with it and keep <laughs> another six years. Keep trying. But yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!